Welcome to Full Prefrontal, the show that exposes the mysteries of executive functions. This show is a collection of conversations about the role of the prefrontal cortex, which impacts your focus, planning, problem solving, emotional balance, and independence. These conversations will introduce mental tools that will empower you to shift your mindset for a successful life. And now, here's your host, Sucheta Kamath. And welcome back to Full Prefrontal, where we are exposing the mysteries of executive function. As always, I am here with our host, Sucheta Kamath. Good morning, my friend. As usual, so good to be with you. Very much looking forward to today's conversation. Same here, Todd. Great to be here with you as well. And I've been thinking about our topic of executive function. And recently, I did a talk to uh, almost 100 teachers. And in preparation, I had sent them a survey. And the question I asked is, what percentage of your everyday interactions with your students involve executive function? And to my surprise, most of them rated uh, somewhere between 0 to 25%. And that just was very shocking to me. And one more question I had asked is, how many of your children struggle with attention? And boom, that number went very high. So what surprised me about that answer is more importantly, the attitude that one harbors with respect to executive function. Unless the term or official diagnosis is, in, is involved, most educators are not comfortable with the term executive function. However, their description of the most problematic learner or most challenging kid in the classroom is the one with executive function. And that's what is so exciting about today's guest. I am going to be talking to somebody who understands this deeply and brings this into her work. You know, one of the things that is smashing about this guest is she gets it. I have been in the field for 20 years and I have seen a sort of evolution. First, people didn't even know the term frontal lobes or let alone knowing that there are two of them, not one. And eventually it has evolved into describing social emotional difficulties and then self-regulation, self-awareness, metacognition. And then we have landed in this uh, zone where we are describing executive function as an umbrella, describing lots and lots of skills. So today, what we are hoping to do is, of course, understand this better. And who better than uh, a fellow speech and language pathologist? And it's my total delight to introduce Hannah Bogan Novak. She is a speech and language pathologist and a social cognitive specialist based in Los Angeles, California, with primary focus on interventions that support self-regulation, social communication, executive functioning, social emotional development, and speech language deficits. Hannah is the owner of a Bogan speech language therapy practice. She has a new position as, as the SLP division director at the Center for Connection, co-founded by Tina Pay Bryson. And she has co-authored a book with Daniel Siegel, which is amazing. And uh, Hannah is also co-creator of a spectacular curriculum. We'll talk about that today. It's called the Brain Talk Curriculum. And in addition to her clinical work, Hannah provides training and consultation to schools, therapy teams, parents to support greater understanding of our focus areas, as well as providing strategies and resources to professionals. So welcome, Hannah, to the podcast. Thanks so much. I am really excited to be here. So I have been asking this question of a lot of my guests. Since you specialize in executive function, do you mind telling us a little bit about your own executive function skills? And do you give yourself an A plus? And <laughs> so start there. What do you describe your skills to be? I have to think about how I would grade myself first, and then I'm going to explain my grade. I would like to think that I would give myself an A. Maybe not, though, because I have thoughtless, perfect executive function thinking skills, though I would say what I, what I do really well is I understand where my strengths are and where my challenges are, and I know how to compensate. And I actually think that that's a really helpful way for us to maybe think about and talk about executive function thinking skills with kids, because, you know, all of us have deficits, all of us have areas that are more difficult, all of us have sort of these relative strengths and relative challenges. And for me, I can tell you off the bat, one of my relative challenges is working memory. I Mine too. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of us, I, you know, I think a lot of us who specialize in executive functioning know this about ourselves. A lot of us have working memory challenges. But on the outside, we don't necessarily appear like we have these huge deficits. And I think it's because 
we know how to seek the support that we need. We know how to use the right interventions. We know how to outsource when we get a little overwhelmed with how much stuff or information we're holding on to. And so we look pretty darn functional. And for some, like I also admittedly am totally type A. I love to be in control. So I'm a sucker for all of the more classic, like surface level executive functioning strategies. Like I love planners and color coded folders and calendars. Like I'm an alarm queen. I email myself reminders of things all the time because I figured out that that actually works for me. Yeah, I I always say, Hannah, sorry to interrupt you, but I always tell people, uh, you know, my executive function training skills literally come from all the tools and gadgets I know how to use and how, how I have taught myself to use. And not to brag, but I'm really awesome at it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, totally. I mean, it's, this is why this is why we can go out and teach this to other people because we've kind of figured it out. But it means that we've had to figure out what was hard for us in order to actually make it easier. And I think that's so much of the time, that's what's missing from the interventions that we do with kids is, and, and not even kids, it could be with teens, adults, you know, whoever you might be working with. But we just don't spend any time helping them be aware of their own kind of constellation of strengths and challenges. And so it's really hard for them to know why they would need any strategies, um, when they would even initiate a strategy, how to use it, and then how to reflect on it. Because that's a big part of figuring out what works. You know, I'll use something like a new planner and I'll look at myself and say, gosh, I didn't even look at that after the first week. I love putting all my stickers in it and, you know, filling it out with different colored pens, but I've got to find something that becomes more effective for me. So, so there you go. I'm going to be gentle with myself and give myself an A. And I am shocked, Hannah, that there's something underneath it. How anal retentive you sound, you should have given yourself A++. But All but, right. Well, then I'll give myself an A++ <laughs> with a fantastic stamp on top. <laughs> <laughs> so one more question about that. You know, you and I, our work is so metacognitive in nature and mm-hmm. this uh, exfoliating the mind so that you discover the true nature of your approach. To me, I think the most fascinating skill is self-devised strategic thinking. And so my question is, is there anything in formal years of learning that you discovered or strategies that you were told or that kind of, you know, became this aha moment for you? And it may not have been, but I was just curious, did you as a learner and thinker at a young age, when did you discover this connection between your abilities and your own thinking about your abilities? That's a great question. I don't know that I could pinpoint a moment, but I can tell you about what that transformation maybe looked like. So in high school, I was in a pretty rigorous academic program. And I remember I was surrounded by a lot of peers who were without question, phenomenal test takers, phenomenal test takers. I mean, they're really bright. They were, and they still are. And I definitely, you know, I I wasn't a dull crayon in the box, but I also wasn't maybe the sharpest when you compare sort of everybody in the program. But I think one of the big differences is I realized that it wasn't just about having the under, sort of this ex- exceptional underlying intellectual capacity that allowed you to be successful or allowed me to be successful. A lot of it was the amount of effort or work or sort of organization that I had to be able to produce at the end of the day. It was both the process and the output and the product. And a good friend of mine from high school, when we both we went off to different colleges and um, sort of had our own experiences, but we kept in touch for many years. And she talked about the challenges that she faced, despite being a really, really intelligent individual, the challenges that she faced just managing the experience of college and that she was actually flunking out of one of her classes. And she said, it's so frustrating because I've passed you know, every, or I've sort of done well on every assignment, I've done well on every exam, but I didn't show up for certain in-class activities because I didn't realize that they were happening. And she said, and now I'm grappling with this sort of mismatch between how, you know, what I know and how I performed. And so I guess it was this journey of awareness that for me, a lot of the strength in executive functioning and then my interest in executive functioning came out of realizing that there was a real difference between underlying intellectual capacity and your ability to produce something 
and produce it well. And a lot of that had to do with the process itself, right? Like, did you have the right kind of mental graphic organizers, if you will, to get yourself from point A to point B? And could you see both the forest and the trees? I guess it's a lot of that gestalt processing and shifting between the big picture and the details. And sometimes people with really high intellect struggle with that. And it's that ability maybe to to use all these different tools that were helpful for me to be successful and actually kind of be able to produce, if you will. I mean, I use that term loosely. I think that we can be, you know, talking about production as like an assignment itself in college, but also social success is sort of an outcome or a product of effort put in to a particular interaction or conversation. And and so, yeah, I think my awareness of those strengths came from seeing other people who were also very bright or who were far brighter than me, but who struggled with that process. Um, and ultimately, it impacted the outcome. Yeah, and I think that's such a wonderful insight as a clinician, because that has probably shaped a lot of your approaches is to really, un, uh, you know, almost opening the lid so that people can peek into their own selves. So yes. let's jump right into this idea of, you know, there's so many uh, complex uh, ways people talk about executive function. There's confusion whether is executive function same as self-regulation? You know, where does attention fit into this? And then where does uh, your thinking about your thinking? So tell us from your point of view where you sit and you, just like me, treat people with challenges. Uh, what functional framework do you use to describe executive function? Well, I definitely agree with you. I think that there are subtle and sometimes a little more glaring, but often very subtle differences between how we define executive functioning among different professionals. And I think a lot of that has to do with the lens through which you're looking. So somebody who's really concerned with kind of neuroanatomy might have a slightly different lens than somebody who is really focused on day-to-day behavior. Not to say that there isn't an intersection between those folks, but you know, somebody thinking more about structure might have a slightly different definition than somebody thinking more about behavior or function. I really jive with Russell Barkley's kind of big model of executive functioning, which is a melding or or maybe not even so much a melding, but almost a dissection of executive functioning to acknowledge that self-regulation is a critical component of executive functioning. So in a nutshell, Russell Barkley tends to say executive functioning is, or executive functions are a set of thinking skills that we use in order to engage in deliberate, self-regulated, goal-directed behavior, which I love because that definition makes sense to parents, it makes sense to teachers. If you work with adolescents or teens, right, we're using language that I think is digestible for a wide audience. And I agree with him. He's right that when we are getting ourselves off of autopilot, suddenly we have a goal in front of us, the behavior is deliberate, and you are regulated from the bottom up. We're thinking about sort of overall brain regulation. Your survival brain feels regulated, your emotional brain feels regulated, and your thinking brain is now available to engage. That is when we are most sort of present and available to engage with our executive function skills. So that's that's kind of the big picture mm. approach that I have to executive functioning. Yeah, and what I love about, and uh, thank you for sharing that you too uh, really love uh, Russell Barkley's theory. And what I appreciate there is if you take any and every skill when you attach self-directed. So if you say goals, mm-hmm. it is devised by me, for me. When you talk about actions devised by me, for me. Uh If you talk about problem solving devised by me, for me. So if you keep referencing to the self aspect to it, because otherwise, you know, I see a lot of, and tell me if you do too, but in my practice, I see a lot of really bright students. And the biggest dilemma the parents or educators have about these bright students is why are they still unsuccessful? Because they have the capacity to problem solve, but they never direct that ability to towards self. (laughs) <laughs> they they can solve yeah. worse problems, but they're not solving their own problems. Yes. I'm late. How do I not make myself late? But if you are late, they have great suggestions for you. <laughs> right. Right. And I do think that that's, that is sort of the, the crux of, I don't want to say where we failed in supporting executive functioning 
challenges with kids, but I think where there is still so much room for us to grow and develop interventions, which is we have wonderful, what I'm going to call strategic thinking tools for kids, right? There are books written about this or curricula that are out there for the tools themselves that we would give to a student in order to produce something, right? And a sort of an outcome or an actual product or a paper or whatever it might be. But if they can't figure out how it applies to them and what their own deficits are and have that real reflective review skill in place, then they end up being these students who are constantly dependent upon some other person to say, ooh, wouldn't it have been really great if you had used X, Y, and Z tool? Or gosh, I wonder why you were so unsuccessful and the student can regurgitate why. They just can't initiate in the moment. And one of the things that I love about the Barclay kind of framework is that infusion of self-regulation which if yeah. it's funny if you ask if you ask like a group of parents or or even a group of teachers or a group of whoever what do you think of when you think of self regulation you'll hear answers like it's impulse control or it's anger management or you know it's sort of these these very narrow views of what regulation means and i have had the pleasure of being able to do a lot of collaboration and work with a really brilliant educational therapist by the name of Carrie Lindemuth, who is the co-author and co-creator of the Brain Talk curriculum. And she has thought a lot about self-regulation as it relates to executive functioning. And she and I have really grappled with this. And the way that she describes it is as this multifaceted concept that I think gets at what, what you were emphasizing a few minutes ago with the need for strategies for executive functioning to be at the end of the day, me oriented, like I need to be self-directed in my use of them. So she says, self-regulation is about regulating your team, which is an acronym. I am a lover of acronyms. I think that they're the best. Talk um, about that. Team, <laughs> yep. That's, I, I, this is how, again, like working memory deficit. So acronyms save me. Team is broken down like this. T stands for your thoughts and attention. So bigger self-regulation requires regulation of your thoughts and attention. You know, you mentioned it in the intro story that teachers are really concerned about their students' attention, right? Ding, ding, ding. Off the bat, we've got an element of self-regulation and bigger executive functioning going on. The E is emotional regulation. And I'm going to be really careful about what I'm talking about when I say emotional regulation. I am not saying that we are teaching kids how to control the emotions they feel. <laughs> That's a pretty futile effort. I think that, you know, there are strategies, you know, mindfulness is a really great way to get more acquainted with your emotions. And, and as mindfulness practice has become I think, more commonplace in the educational setting, which is great, more and more we're, we're talking about emotions and emotional regulation as it relates to learning. But what I'm talking about with emotional regulation is being able to manage how you behave, regulate your action despite what you're feeling. <laughs> and that is not always easy. It's not always easy as an adult with relatively decent executive functioning. The A in the acronym is regulating your actions. So this is going to get into impulse inhibition, but it's not just don't push the red button style of impulse in inhibition. We're also talking about how can a student maybe shift away from something preferred to something less preferred, right? So it's not just about how do they initiate, it's also about how do they stop or shift. Modulation gets brought under this bigger umbrella. So are you working with students who are real zero to 60 kids? Like they're either hot or cold, but they really struggle to be somewhere in between and kind of match the situational demands. That also falls within this idea of regulating action. Um, and then the M this is what I love about Carrie. Like she's so brilliant because she says that's where most people stop, TEA. But what they're missing is the M and the M is motivation, regulation of motivation. And how often as a clinician do you work with a student and you're super motivated for them to have strong executive function skills, <laughs> right? Like you really want them to be successful in whatever the endeavor or goal is that you have for them and that even maybe they think they have for themselves. But at the end of the day, something about motivation just gets in the way. 
Like maybe they were never motivated to do the English paper to begin with, or maybe they were, but it was way too far into the future. So, you know, bringing that piece in, I think gives us this much more interesting and useful lens to start to think about executive functioning before we ever get to now, what's the actual tool that you're going to use? All of those other things have to be regulated first. Yeah. Oh my God. So many things to talk about here. I think one important thing about your message, and it speaks to my heart and I share the same philosophy and principles, you know, we are not doing two kids. We want the kids to be able to do to their future goals. Yes. So, so this idea of fixing somebody is totally wrong. It's mm-hmm. aiding somebody to become in charge of their brain. So my favorite line is, is your brain in charge of you or you, are you in charge of your brain? And, yes. and so so this idea about a teacher-directed, parent-directed or other-directed regulation is not self-regulation. So it's let's not even waste time saying we are helping develop self-regulation, but I am in charge of it. So right. if, if you don't have the meta process with it, you can't really succeed. The second Absolutely. point you you really talk about, and I would love to see if you can elaborate each individual aspect of this uh, self-regulatory, you know, get, getting a handle on your team in terms of the metacognition. Uh, what would the strategies would look like when you're regulating thoughts, when you're regulating emotions? And if you can just also help our listeners understand that from a therapeutic point of view, we have to literally isolate each individual strand to polish it, develop it, and then uh, master it before we put it back, so to speak, into Mm -hmm. the big picture. But how does that look like in a scene when it's a dynamic situation, when the kid is expected to manage their thinking, redirect their thoughts, redirect Mm -hmm. their actions? So what does the journey look like? So I am a big believer that the journey begins always through a metacognitive lens. I think metacognition has really picked up in in steam, right? It's like it's picked, it's gotten some traction lately as a big buzzword, which is great because it is an important term as it relates to executive functioning. But just to make sure sort of I'm on the same page with you and, and listeners are all on the same page, you know, basic idea of metacognition is your ability to not only think about your own thinking, but have kind of this introspective awareness, this self-awareness of, and I'm going to go back to this phrase, your constellation of strengths and challenges, right? It's, we all have things that are relative strengths, relative challenges. And by understanding what those are, we begin to understand where we need support. And ideally, my understanding, me, myself, as potentially the client is consistent with the understanding that somebody who is supporting me also has of you know, how I think and how I function and and what my strengths and challenges are. So regardless of the age, right, we need to be approaching interventions through a metacognitive lens. And if you work with really young students, and I do work with really young kiddos, I do some early intervention work, there is still a place for this kind of self-awareness and brain learning to come into therapy. And certainly as students either get older or sort of more developmentally capable, we can do a lot more. We can dive a lot deeper into them understanding themselves. So I really start with students hearing the same message that I'm saying on this, uh, in this conversation, which is that they have a regulation team. Like we start with what does your brain look like? Let's get sort of a general sense of what's happening in your brain when you feel an impulse to react versus what's happening in your brain when you're able to sort of thoughtfully or mindfully respond. And that takes time. And we might just focus on that for a while, or we might be doing that alongside with other interventions. And as we go through that, we begin to go through this process of a client meeting themselves, right? Like they need to understand what's going on on their own self-regulation team. So if you're thinking specifically about thoughts and attention, A really nice place to start is beginning to have a client acknowledge when is my attention shifting away from whatever the task is or whatever my goal is, and am I able to come back? And depending on the curriculum or the approach that you pick up, there are a lot out there. You might be framing this in different ways. So if you are coming at this from like a social communication, social regulation approach, and you're really familiar with the social thinking kind of, you know, world of support. You might be using the term, is my brain in the group? 
Do you, do you mean the really... We Thinkers curriculum? Yeah, so We yeah. Thinkers, even there's, there's other curricula within the social thinking umbrella that would reference the idea of your brain being in the group as well. So that okay. relates to attention, your ability to attend to the salient thing, whether that's a, a specific task that you're doing or whether that's, you know, it's something important in a social interaction. Other people like to use, there's a neat little book that's kind of its own curriculum called Hunter and His Amazing Remote Control, right? I've seen that one get used. And this idea of your brain is kind of like a remote control and we can, we have the ability to control what channel we're on. So I actually really do like that, that uh, metaphor, I guess, when you're working with younger kids, like, oh gosh, what channel is your brain on right now? Because we're all yeah. over here on the, you know, math channel. I wonder what channel your brain is on. And we're always doing this in a neutral or sort of observational way. Because if you say to a child, what channel is your brain on, you know, Jackson, and, and Jackson says, uh-oh, it was on the, you know, SpongeBob SquarePants channel, and you immediately sort of go after him, right? Like it's immediate, an immediate punitive consequence. Like, well, we're supposed to be on the math channel and you're not with the group. Jackson is never going to want to tell you what channel his brain is on again, right? Like we've now <laughs> yes. associated this self-awareness <laughs> with a really punitive outcome when in reality, the, what I believe is the ideal response is like, wow, I am so proud you figured out what you were thinking about. You figured out what your you know, attention was stuck on. That's really cool. Here's the thing, right? We're going to borrow some language from like Ross Green's collaborative problem solving script. I love that phrase. Here's the thing. <laughs> we're over here on the math channel, I wonder how we can help your brain shift, or I wonder how we can help you come back to the group planner. Again, whatever language it is that you're using therapeutically, you know, I think you can fit that in. Um, and so then the next step with an intervention is kids have to be able to understand is the distractor that they're experiencing internal or external, right? Is it something that's kind of environmentally driven? Like, holy cow, the, the fact that I sit right next to the door of my classroom and every time a group of students walks by, my attention is pulled away and I'm, I have such a hard time shifting back. That would be an external distractor or so can I could, internal. Yeah. Can I quickly ask you about this? So self-awareness is a double-edged sword, isn't it? Uh -huh. So the more aware you become, more depressed you're likely to become to recognize <laughs> that I suck. <laughs> yes. And I say right, that great fair. love for our, our young learners. So, right. but, so, so you're right. I think that how do you see uh, when you're bringing somebody to discover this about self without feeling discouraged, but also when you begin to exfoliate this or address this in a group setting, as everybody's asked to take temperature of their own selves, mm -hmm. what if you're so way off that it becomes a source of embarrassment rather than insight? And as you know, a lot of our kids who struggle with self-awareness are also emotionally labile. They tend to cry, right. easily, they tend to lose it easily. So do you have some ideas how to redirect that particular aspect? Well, I think that this is where we as speech language pathologists, you know, really can either borrow from or get actual support from some of our related professional colleagues, right? Like this is where we start to dip into understanding the importance of like safe attachment and, and safe relationships between a therapist or a support person and a student so that we've developed kind of this this safety net, right? Like a very real emotional safety net where a child can be vulnerable with us and know that it's okay to acknowledge that something might be challenging. I think in the process as well of identifying what might be going wrong, we have to be really conscientious that we're also identifying their strengths. And I'm not saying this, you know, from the, yeah, like, I love oh, that. Everybody, yeah. everybody does have something they're good at and everybody, you know, <laughs> sure, whatever. But I mean, in a very real sense, everybody does have something that they are sort of capable of doing. And we all know as therapists, you have to use what a student can do well to facilitate what's challenging for them, right? Like we all kind of know Absolutely. that. And I think we have to make that very apparent to students as we're working with them. Everything isn't challenging. And if you're hearing that language from students, everything is hard. I'm not good at anything. Like I'm the worst. If you're hearing that really extreme language, that should be a red flag that there is a bigger emotional regulation challenge going on, or there's a bigger sort of perceptual challenge going on. 
right? That's kind of that black or white thinking. It's the all or nothing language. And all of us can buy into that at different times in our life. So you may need to take a little side trip to really explore, is that like a one-time, you know, I was frustrated and I was triggered and I kind of went there as a client, but I'm able to be pulled back. And once my thinking brain kind of turns back on, I can challenge what those extreme beliefs are? Or is that a place that your client is getting really stuck? And if you are someone who has the training and expertise and ability to go down that path with a client and maybe walk with them at their pace and really support that emotional regulation piece along with the the maybe attention focus that you have, that's great. And if not, then that's a really good time to refer or bring in another expertise. Because I do think that many of our students who struggle with executive functioning have something going on with anxiety or depression, right? Because they, in many cases, we're talking about a production deficit here. Like, it's not that they're incapable of coming up with a goal or that they, you know, have nothing that motivates them or that they don't get that they're being unsuccessful. In many cases, we're talking about this population of kids who tend to be chronically unsuccessful and sometimes can tell you exactly what they should have done or would have done. It's that they're getting hijacked. Their thinking brain is getting hijacked by their survival and emotional brain through dysregulation, and they just can't access the strategies that they have been taught, if they've been taught strategies. So I think we have to really care for the emotional well-being as we explore some of this and be very intentional about helping students identify where their strengths do lie. And that's across the board. That's whether you're thinking about thought. And I really like it. Thank you for like really roping this in this idea of the dysregulation that you're going to bump into that is going to give an impression that you're having a setback or the child is having a setback. But yeah, it's a group of deficits that are create these barriers in adjusting and adapting and flexibly moving on to mm-hmm. life's ch- demands. One interesting thing you said about the children when they're stuck, I think often a lot of times clinicians come in with an agenda or teachers come in with an agenda with a, a way to support the child. And there's a pushback about the way the support is offered <laughs> and yeah. the support has not even begun. Uh, But there is a resistance to the support. And many clinicians I have spoken to and uh, I train and the teachers I train uh, talk about that they suddenly become annoyed and then their own emotional dysregulation steps in and creates uh, miniature havoc. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Dysregulation totally breeds dysregulation. And I, I said at one point, I admittedly, I don't know how articulately, but, (laughs) but I, I think what I said earlier is, a student ideally needs to have a consistent awareness as to the awareness that we as a support person have. And in many cases, that's not where we start, right? So a student may not even realize how much support they're getting to be successful. They may think they're being relatively independent, or they may not even realize how independent they could be, right? Like there's this mismatch. There's a tool that I love to use when I'm doing trainings sort of with big groups, but also when I'm in a more consultative uh, setting and I'm working with maybe a, let's say like an apparent meeting between parents and teachers and a student. And it's called the POP in support scale and POP stands for point of performance, yeah, um, which is that. a, yeah, which is a term that references uh, how much support do I need in the moment that I am executing a task? That's what point of performance support would be. And so everybody should picture in your thought bubble, a five point scale, like a basic, you know, five at the top, all the way down to one. And the idea is we're moving from one up to five in the intensity of how much support a student needs to be successful and how we would fill that in, of course, varies student to student and by age or by developmental level, um, right? Like an older student might have more access to technological support than say, you know, what a four-year-old would have. but Generally speaking, you know, the big tenants are this. If you are at a one or a two level support, then that means in this pop in support scale that you yourself are able to somehow manipulate some kind of tool or strategy in your environment in order to be successful. 
you understand that you're outsourcing to some extent, but you are the one doing it and you remember to do it and you're successful doing it. So a good example of that is when I put an appointment in my own calendar on my phone and then I add an alert to to remind me about it five minutes before it happens, that's me manipulating my own environment using strategies to be successful. Right. Exactly. The so minute, self-identified and self-evaluated yes, exactly. like efficacy of it. Okay, great. Yes, great. Exactly. Yeah. The minute that you move from a two to a three, you're gonna cross something that we, when I say we, I'm saying Carrie Lindemuth, the brilliant educational therapist I mentioned before, who actually really like developed, like figured this scale out. So when she and I talk about this, we say when you cross from a two to a three, you have crossed the big divide. And the big divide is the difference between I, me, myself, and managing the strategies to someone else just got involved. So when you're at a level three, someone else is now supporting me, but they're doing it in this distant way. So if I need my mom to send me a text message when I get home from school in order to remember to let the dog out, that's a level three. Like my mom has now stepped in, but with a little bit of support, I'm able to be successful. Exactly. When you move from a three to a four, you've crossed the little divide. The little divide means not only is someone else involved, but now they have to share space with me. So a four is they need to share space with me to get me started on whatever it is I'm doing. And again, you can think about this as isolated task specific or social interaction specific. If you're a therapist who does group therapy or really focuses on social communication, you're like, look, this doesn't apply to me. You are wrong because how often are you sort of helping a student initiate in a social interaction and then you're pulling away, right? Like we're talking about scaffolded support here. So at a four, you're, you're with that child getting them started or the child themselves needs support. And by the time you reach a five, they need someone consistently with them in order to be successful. And I love to use this scale, right? Like I will sit down with it with a group of people, ideally with the student present, if it's appropriate. And we really talk about like, gosh, what are we seeing? Everybody has a different sense of what's going on and we need to figure out where we're starting. And it's okay if a student needs level five support. Like there's nothing inherently wrong with level five. And in fact, all of us as as functional adults need level five support sometimes when we do something totally new. Like if I had to change the air filter in my car, I would need level five support. I would need somebody with me, sharing space with me, walking me through it the entire time. Does that mean I would need level five support forever? Probably not, but I definitely would at first and that's okay. The problem (laughs) lies in a moment where a child is saying, I'm totally cool with level five support across the board. And the people supporting them say, I hear you and we cannot offer you level five support. So that's one issue. The other is if a child thinks that they're way down at a one or a two and someone else is leasing out their frontal lobes to be the child's executive functioning, right? Like that they don't even realize that they're actually providing a much higher level of support. And we now need to grapple with, okay, where are we starting and where are we going? And so we say to students, independence does not come from being at a one for everything or a zero, right? I don't even need strategies. I just remember everything. That's not the goal. The goal is that you know what amount of support you need and you effectively access it. That is self-advocacy. That is effective executive functioning and it's metacognition. It's like everything. And it's just the starting point. Now we're ready to actually intervene, right? Exactly. And so my philosophy is it's all about backing up. It's about saying we've got a really nice house that we're building, but we're doing it with a really crummy foundation. And so we've got to back up if you want this house to stand around for 100 years. Amazing. You have addressed so many important questions and concerns I often have when people zealously support kids who are struggling with one outcome in mind, which is let this child demonstrate his true potential. And Mm -hmm. I have always argued that uh, supported true potential isn't really true potential because Mm -hmm. (laughs) somebody else is doing the job of frontal lobes while the child is doing the job of the worker brain, right? the, the slogger brain. So, you know, before we come to an end, I mean, I could talk to you for hours 
as we come to an end, I was thinking about, I bet you are consumed with uh, the thought that how poorly executive function is understood. You know, my podcast is a simple measure to get people to understand the wide applicability and universality of these skills. And you and I were talking about this yesterday as well. So why do you wish and that more people knew about executive function? And why is it so critical for us to become executive function savvy as a society? You know, I don't know if it's so much of the specific content that I wish they knew, but I'm going to, I'll do what I've, I've claimed that I'm constantly doing, which is backing up a little, which is to say, I wish that there was an across the board acceptance of the fact that understanding what's going on in our brains when we have an impulse to react versus, you know, the ability to make a plan and sort of go through this process of mindfully responding. I wish that it was understood that that is important for every single person in their development. Like no one is harmed by knowing more about their brain at all. Like there's, there's just not, there's not a downside to that. There's really only, in my opinion, an upside and a potential. And I think, you know, just sort of narrowing the lens and looking at the educational domain for a little, for a moment, I do think that we are seeing an awakening to the importance of supporting self-regulation and executive functioning in the learning sphere. I hear it more and more, you know, it's, it's the reason that I have a whole element of my job, which is getting to work with teachers Um, to do trainings and coaching and consultation to really build their awareness. I think where the question is starting to shift is not, should we care about this stuff? It's like, it's how do we begin to infuse this into an already packed curriculum, right? And, And how do we support the development of these skills for all students so that everybody benefits and the students who really need the additional support now have a leg up? And I think that there's a lot of different ways that you can do that. The curriculum that Carrie and I co-created is one of those ways, right? It's certainly not the only thing that's out there. But what we saw was a need for people to have language to be able to describe what's going on in your brain during the process of kind of neural connectivity, right? The conversation of neural integration that allows you to move from, I am just reacting to the world around me. Like I feel and so I react. Um, to a much more kind of developed, mature, executive function, savvy ability to, I am acknowledging that I feel an impulse. I am able to pause that impulse. We say you have to insert the pause. And then I can engage this conversation between my feeling brain and my thinking brain to say, okay, here's what I feel right now inside of a now bubble. And here's what I want in the future, right? This is a goal that I have. And then I'm going to shift. I'm going to use this beautiful capacity I have as a human being to use mental time travel, right? In the moment, I can think into the future about a goal I want, and then I can shift into the past and really say, what do I know from the past in order to help me make a plan for right now? And brain talk breaks all of this down, right? We create characters for the amygdala and the basal pleasure and reward circuit and the kind of prefrontal cortex, but also the bigger idea of like the critical thinking aspects of the brain and the hippocampus, right? These major players that tend to be involved in the process of mindful responding in order to create a narrative that makes sense. I would say for kids, but I actually think that most adults everybody don't needs stuff, it, right? <laughs> right? Everybody helps. And, and we're simplifying it in a way so that a kid can say, you know, instead of expecting a child to be able to say, uh, excuse me, grown up, you know, my amygdala appears to be perceiving a threat. I don't know whether it's real or, you know, <laughs> kind of imagine, <laughs> but I am getting a blast of cortisol. I feel this extreme impulse to, you know, you pick fight, flight, freeze. Like I'm having this avoid impulse and I'm about to react. Like that's an unreasonable expectation to have, I think, for someone who doesn't just like breathe this stuff in all day. But a kid could totally learn about the amygdala in a developmentally appropriate way. We call it MIG and it looks like a little almond shaped creature, right? (laughs) Um, And sort of personify it and be able to say, I'm having a MIG moment. And that is so powerful, right? This ability to put language to the abstract experience of engaging executive functioning when you feel an impulse, that is power. That is a tool in and of itself, right? Like the awareness becomes a tool that everything else depends upon. 
And I guess so, you know, to really answer your question, it's I wish that people both got on board with we have to teach kids about their brains. Like we just, like this is this is just as important as a basic math curriculum or a basic literacy curriculum because our ability to learn everything else depends upon our ability to be regulated. And then that we had sort of an emphasis on doing it in a developmentally appropriate way, you know, which we hope Brain Talk is for a lot of kids. But like I said, there's lots of programs and strategies out there to do this and to be consistent in you know, really supporting kids along their journey of developing executive functioning because it, it's gonna it's gonna be a while, right? Like it takes a while for <laughs> all of these structures to really to really mature. Well, I think you could not have your passion comes through so beautifully, and you could not have explained this more eloquently than you just did. I really hope that we don't have a separate teaching and self regulation. Do not need to be two separate things. They need to be mm-hmm. a meshed, and mm-hmm. we don't need to pick kids out because they're failing and then intervene. I think just like you, if I am given a chance to be on my soapbox, that's exactly why I developed EXQ, which is a curriculum designed to directly provide intervention to the children so that they can develop understanding of self and they can self uh, redirect using uh, self device strategic thinking. So not just knowing knowing who I am, uh, but how do I uh, take this knowledge and now become a better version of myself? But I'm not becoming a better version of myself because I lack something. But this is the journey of life. You know, this is what good people of this earth do. (laughs) Um, Oh my gosh, I love it. And one idea that I have, my metacognitive training It's called the meta, which is mindful examination of thinking and awareness. And it has this very complex system. But one thing that you have talked about repeatedly, which is, you know, self-awareness is impaired for those who need the help with Mm -hmm, mm self-awareness. Because what if their self-appraisal is poor, then you cannot really, what if you give yourself 100 sizzle points and call it a day? No, right. (laughs) Right. So part of this gingerly providing some nudge that say, what if you're wrong? We need to figure out some amazing behavioral and psychological means to reach out to kids who are not afraid to say, yeah, I'm not that great. You know, that should be our mission as we educate and prepare our children. So Hannah, you are brilliant. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, you. sharing your wisdom and, and uh, keep up uh, with amazing work that you're doing and can't wait to connect again. Thank you so much. It's been a lot of fun. All right. That's all the time we have for today. And if you're like me, I took an awful lot of notes. So if you know of someone who might benefit from listening to today's conversation, we would be most grateful if you would kindly forward it to them. So on behalf of our host, Sucheta Kamath, today's guest, Hannah Bogan Novak, and all of us at Cerebral Matters, thanks for listening today. And we look forward to seeing you again right here next week on Full Prefrontal. Thank you for listening to Full Prefrontal, exposing the mysteries of executive functions. To contact our host, Sucheta Kamath, and learn more about her work on improving executive functions, visit her website at CerebralMatters.com. That's CerebralMatters.com. Tune in next week for the next informative episode of Full Prefrontal.